I noticed that when Barack Obama spoke recently at Mandela's memorial celebration, he said of Nelson Mandela, we shall not look upon his like again. And that, of course, is a line from Shakespeare's Hamlet. All of which is a rather roundabout way, uh, and it brings me to the nature of realism in the novel. And I want to look at two sorts of realism. One I should call social realism, and the other is magic realism. So let's take a look at social realism first. I'm talking of novelists mainly here. Poets always know about magic. Those of us who come from and belong to the Caribbean are familiar with the histories of slavery, indentured labour, migration, and all sorts of economic injustice. One of the giants of modern Caribbean literature, George Lamming, from this island, uses his novel, The Castle of My Skin, to introduce to the world a view of lives that have been shaped by the racial and social traumas of colonialism and imperialism. Lives that had hitherto lacked a voice. It was one of the earliest examples of a literature described by Salman Rushdie as the empire writes back. It can be a way of pointing to certain injustices, both current and historical. It is grounded in the economic and social realities of people's lives. I want to throw in an idea here uh, about the nature of social realism, particularly in English-speaking ex-colonies uh, in the Anglophone tradition. Desmond Tutu in South Africa once said about colonialism, when the missionaries came, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened our eyes, we had the Bible and they had the land. He also said that the colonists came with a gun in one hand and the Bible in the other. And I want to suggest that there was a particular influence which came with the British colonizers, and that was the Protestant Church in all its various denominations. And I want to argue that it had an effect on literature, and countries which have a predominantly Protestant ethic show a tendency to social realism in their literature. By the Protestant ethic, I mean the general values and attitudes that permeate a society which is mainly Protestant. Of course, in our region there are other influences. African, Indian, Amerindian traditions have also uh, have, have a continued existence and vitality. By the Protestant traditions, I refer to um, certain qualities such as truth-telling, austerity, thrift, simplicity, nothing too fancy, plain speaking, authenticity, independent-mindedness, bearing witness, and the ability to speak the truth to power. The tradition of testimony and bearing witness, I suggest, results in a tendency towards realism in literature. Mm. Many of these qualities are useful in literature. Economy and thrift of the written word can be a wonderful thing, because we all know of writing that is excessively flowery, ornate, and uses a long word where a short one would be better. However, this question of authenticity or bearing witness can present a problem. It can be constricting to an author. The notion, for instance, that you can only write about somewhere if you come from there, it gradually places increasing limits on the writer. Taken to its logical conclusion, it would mean that women could only write about women, that black people could not write about white people that Jamaicans could not write about Guyanese. Such restrictions come partly from the testimonial tradition and the demand for authenticity. Recently, a Trinidadian friend of mine, and a literary scholar who lives in England, complained to a well-known newspaper that because she was black, they only ever asked her to review literature by black writers. The newspaper, seeking authenticity, limited what she was more than capable of doing. Those are the restricting factors in the demand for authenticity, and writers should not be constrained by such straitjackets. 
Authenticity and expertise, mind you, are sometimes confused. If you come from some particular background, you're supposed to be an expert in it, which is not always the case. As the saying goes, an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less. Um, in Guyana, a couple of years ago, there was a novel which was very popular. It was called The Sly Company of People Who Care by Raul Bhattacharya. It caught the essence and spirit and humour of Guyana. The only trouble was it wasn't written by a Guyanese. It was written by a temporary visitor from India who had popped into Guyana and looked around him and then written a novel. Um, or consider the novelist Joseph Conrad. He was Polish. His second language was French. He wrote a marvellous novel in English called Lord Jim. And it's about a young Englishman, the son of a pastor who became a sailor. Now, nobody says that Conrad had no right to create an English hero because he came from Poland. Nobody looks for Conrad's authenticity and says he should have been English to write about an Englishman. The author's imagination and the abilities of the author can transcend such notions. Salman Rushdie said in his novel Shame, sometimes I think roots are a conservative myth designed to keep us in our place. Actually, there's a poem to a, a Louise Bennett poem. I'm going to try and remember it, and you must forgive me, I, do, I can't do a Jamaican accent, but it's something like, um, uh, What a devil of a bump and bore, rig jig and pal and pan, if the whole world had to go back where their great grandpa come from. Um, because people try and keep you in a post-colonial box. It happens with all artists when they dare to try and explore and write about something different. The critics, and often the academics, try and keep them doing the work with which they, the critics, are familiar, and the categories into which they have put the artists. But writers must not be afraid of breaking out and exploring new areas and not just repeating the familiar even if that has led to success previously. Look at the uproar Bob Dylan caused when he changed from acoustic to electric guitar. However, this region, the Caribbean South America, has had a history riven with trauma and conflict and the oppression of one group by another. And realism in our literature has served an important purpose in bearing witness to that history and commenting on injustice. But it is not the only form that literature can take. Now I want to talk briefly about another form of realism uh, known as magic realism. And this is not, as many people think, a form of fantasy. The term magic realism comes from the original Spanish phrase lo real maravilloso. And the correct translation is the marvels of reality. Significantly, the first person to develop the theory of L'Oreal Maravilloso in this hemisphere was the Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier. Well, he's known as Cuban, although in fact he was born in Switzerland of Russian and French parentage. Uh, he was raised in Cuba, and this is a fluid region that will absorb what it likes and reject what it doesn't like. Um, and it has no particular regard for bureaucratic classifications. Boundaries and identities can be fluid. But it interested me to realise that writers known for magic realist work tend to be from the Latin and predominantly Catholic countries or from other parts of the world that do not have a Protestant tradition. Salman Rushdie, for instance, another magic realist, has background in both India and Pakistan. And I began to see that the Protestant ethic which is, is common in many of the work in, in the British colonies, um, tends to push people towards a more uh, a, a genre which is really social realistic. Um, Carpentier's notion was that the history and geography of, the, of South America and the Caribbean are both so extreme that they appear fictional or even magical to outsiders. 
It's a region where the line between magic and reality is blurred. In the prologue to his novel, The Kingdom of This World, a novel of the Haitian Revolution, Carpentier laid out his philosophy of magic realism and said, but what is the history of Latin America but a chronicle of magic realism? And it seems that the countries which still have a substantial agricultural base and communities that are closely in touch with nature and the oral tradition will have a, a, a more highly developed disposition towards the magical than the big metropolitan cities of the industrialised world. However, the dominant socialist realist, and realist tendency in English literature has undoubtedly been influenced um, in the English speaking colonies. And going back to the Colombian novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez, whom I've already mentioned, um, and who's probably the best known exponent of Magic Realist novel. And he points to some of the extraordinary but real historical events that for him typify a history that appears so extreme as to be fictional. And he gives the following examples from real life. Papa Doc from Haiti had all the black dogs in the country put down because he believed that one of his enemies, afraid of being taken prisoner and murdered, had turned himself into a black dog. Now that's a fact. Papa Doc had all black dogs in Haiti put down. In the 1930s, Maximiliano Martinez de El Salvador once had the country's street lighting covered in red paper to combat an epidemic of measles. Fact. In 1814, Dr. Fracture, president of Paraguay, for, forbade Spaniards to marry each other and decreed that they could only marry Indians, blacks, or mulattoes. Juan Vicente Gomez, president of Venezuela, at one point, used to have his death announced and then come back to life <laughs> in order to keep the population on their toes. <laughs> now, when you have facts like that, you actually hardly need imagination. Marquez himself says that even when his imagery appears far-fetched, it is based on reality, something he has seen or heard. He maintains that there is not a single line in my novels that is not based on reality. But he gives an example, an event in the south of Argentina. Winds from the South Pole swept the whole surface away, and the next day, fishermen caught the bodies of lions and giraffes in their nets. Now, there might be amazing events in his novels, but they are triggered by an event in reality. And sometimes, it is the most extraordinary works of imagination that have gone beyond reality to, that cast a new light on social reality. Take, for example, the satirical short story The Nose by Gogol, the Ukrainian writer, <coughs> in which a man gets up for breakfast, as usual, cuts a slice of bread, and discovers a nose in the loaf of bread. Even worse, it is the nose of his boss. Now there we have a surreal situation which he explores that manages to teach us about reality and status in the society of the time. Or take the wonderful satirical novel The Master and Margarita by Bulgakov. It was written in the time of Stalin in Russia. It would have been too dangerous to write a novel actually about Stalin in the genre of social reality. So Bulgakov, or well if he had him, he'd have been shipped out to a labor camp or executed. And so he wrote a story about the arrival in Moscow of the devil himself, accompanied by a giant black cat which refuses to pay its fare on the bus. And the use of imagination, allegory, and humor gives us a powerful vision and a political critique of life in those times. It is possible both to use history and to break free from it. It's always possible to imagine other people's lives in different countries or lives in different centuries. 
Usually there is a degree of authenticity that comes from a writer's own background, but it would be ridiculous to say that we cannot imagine what it is like to be other people in other places. The imagination is effortlessly transnational, transracial, transgender, and even transspecies. Think of the children's literature where we imagine being an insect, a Nancy for example, and we can learn lessons from it. As we grow older, we lose that sense of magic or an infinite possibility. But literature is part dream, and we all know that dreams do not obey the laws of sociology, economics, history, or even journalism. Certainly realism is an important strand of literature, but it is not the only one. And powerful myths and stories from many different sources have often influenced writers and been used by them to illuminate the human condition. And that is the fundamental 